thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk tonight. This is um, really exciting. When you when you work on Passive House, I don't know if the rest of you feel this way, but uh, you can feel like you're in the in the wilderness a little bit. That there are a lot of people who, when you mention the words Passive House, they either have no clue what you're talking about or they think they know exactly what you're talking about because it has something to do with the sun coming through the windows. So it's great to be in uh, with a group of people who are so well informed about this being passive house professionals. So I, I know that many of you are, um, you know, you're experts in the technical aspects of passive house and you, you know, every stage of design and execution. I know a lot of you come to these um, virtual gatherings to find out about those details of a project. But for tonight, I want to begin by talking about the um, sort of the, the bigger picture for us, at least because of the way we approach this and particularly because we were not working on a custom home, but working rather on spec as new home builders and trying an experiment uh, in that way. So quite different, I think, from a lot of passive house builds. Um, we do have our, our, our team. Of, uh, of specialists who are on this call tonight as well. So they're definitely going to be part of the presentation later. So don't be disappointed uh, just yet. But I am a generalist. As Sean said, I'm the general manager of Langua Eco Homes, uh, but I'm an editor of nonfiction. I, I work in book publishing, you're used to, and I don't have a building background. I just have an enthusiasm for, for building and for architecture and urban design and so on. But I think the common ground that I have with um, all of you here at the Passive House Accelerator is the shared concern that we have about climate change and a belief that there is the possibility for the built environment to have a positive rather than a negative impact. And as the title of my presentation tonight suggests, I'm gonna share with you some of our experiences in building Passive House right now in the times and the market conditions we find ourselves in. So I think it was obvious that I work with my brother, Mark, in our family owned development company called Langua Eco Homes. My father, uh, John, is also, um, he's more than deeply involved. He's the owner and uh, CEO of the company. And I sometimes refer to him as our chief visionary. Uh, he's not really into virtual presentations, so he decided not to join us tonight, but um, uh, you know, when I introduced my, my dad to the idea of Passive House close to 10 years ago now, um, I think it's fair to say that he really caught the Passive House bug. And he became so committed to it that in a lot of ways, it slowed down our development process because we couldn't, once we had found out about this standard, which was so, so clearly above the rest, uh, we couldn't settle for less on our development land. And we looked far and wide for a builder who would work with us to do passive house development. And we couldn't find anyone who would do that. And in fact, we got a lot of people who said, um, people don't care about the environment. People don't care about, um, they don't think of their houses in terms of, in terms of the environment or climate change. And we just, they, they told us that they found again and again, that no one cared about this and given the choice over between better insulation and a granite countertop, they would take the granite countertop seven days a week and twice on Sunday. So we said, very interesting, but if they don't have the option of a truly better package, how can they choose it? And so um, we, we decided we needed to become not only developers of our land, but builders as well. And that was challenging too, because our, I'm going to tell you more about our lo location in a moment, but I'll, I'll just say that it was, it is um, far enough from the GTA, from the greater Toronto area, that the, uh, there was not a critical mass of people with passive house uh, expertise. And so we needed to, uh, to some extent, we needed to build that, that capacity. It, it started with finding Michael Wilson, who's on our call tonight. He's our, our architect, along with his colleague, Rita Osipa. They are really fine and very original architects. And they knew about Passive House and they jumped at the chance to build to the Passive House standard. They introduced us to Greg Leskin, who uh, he and his colleagues at Zahn Engineering became our mechanical design team. And Greg is our FIAS uh, verifier. And we prevailed upon a longstanding connection to the Hartman family, um, who are custom home builders in our area. And so Glenn Hartman, uh, also with us tonight, became our construction manager. 
and we twisted Ed Marion's arm to come on board as our passive house consultant. It, it, maybe he'll say something at, one, at some point about why he resisted doing that. I don't know, maybe it was the long drive, but we're so grateful that he gave in because his guidance along the way was absolutely invaluable. And finally, we sent some of our team members on Passive House courses to learn how different Passive House would be from other jobs that they had done. And so with a great team in place, we nonetheless faced other challenges that were very specific to the time that we began to build. There were the extra costs of Passive House building and certification while trying to compete with builders who were less burdened by climate concerns or ambitions. There was the pandemic, which changed absolutely everything. The near collapse of supply chains, the exponential increases in materials, uh, materials costs, the ultra low interest rates that caused home prices to increase at unprecedented levels and to an un at an unprecedented pace, more so in Canada than the, in the United States. And then we've more recently felt the whiplash that was created when our central bank decided to curb inflation by steadily raising interest rates. And as we all know, this has caused a sharp drop in new home purchases, especially those like ours that are on, on the higher end of the price scale. But ours is a good news story. And so I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm not gonna do so much talking now. I will move on with, um, with my slides. So here we go. Um, this is what we built. These are our six townhomes. Um, we began the design phase in the early part of 2020 and um, began construction, it took a while to get everything in place and to get um, our designs uh, submitted to FIAS and, and approved. So our construction didn't begin until June of 2021. But these townhouses are pre-certified, design certified by FIAS, and we're currently waiting for final certification. Each unit is approximately 2,200 square feet with three bedrooms and three bathrooms. And we're really proud of the creativity and expertise, expertise of our team that resulted in these beautiful, light-filled and exquisitely finished homes. And I'm gonna show you some more photographs a little bit later. Um, so the, the how it started. Um, our land, our build took place on farmland that's adjacent to a small village called Embro, Ontario. It's about 150 kilometers or 90 miles west of Toronto. And although my parents have farmed in this area since the 1960s, this farm was not our home farm. It was rented by my parents beginning in the 1980s and it was purchased in two phases uh, with the second taking place at an, a farm auction. Very exciting if you've ever been to a farm auction, they sell off everything, the equipment, the household uh, items. And at the end of the day, they sell the farm itself in front of you know, all your neighbors and friends. Um, and that happened in 1997. So this is class one farmland and we've been farming or it organically since about 2010 and the rest of the reform, the farm, um, other than where we're building is still being farmed by us. Um, uh, and my brother Mark is involved in that. In fact, this is an image of the farm, uh, before any development took place. And what you're seeing here, you see the original farmhouse, uh, the green and white uh, farmhouse over here, and the barns, which no longer exist. You get a little glimpse of the village and this main road right here. And our townhouses are built right about here, if you can see my cursor moving around there. Ambro, uh, as I said, is about 150 kilometers from Toronto. It's a serviced village of around 1,000 people. The surrounding area is largely agricultural and most people in the community have some connection to the land. Oxford County is one of the most productive agricultural areas in all of Canada. The, the productivity of the land within the Great Lakes area is one of the main reasons, one of the main historical drivers of settlement in southwestern Ontario. Today it is one of the most densely populated areas in Canada. The village of Ambro might be 150 kilometers from Toronto, but it's only 14 kilometers, less than a 10 minute drive from an entrance to the to Highway 401, which is Southern Ontario's largest traffic art artery, which gives us ready access to a lot of larger communities. The 401 reaches all the way from the Detroit or Windsor area in Canada, all the way to Montreal. So 
I want to tell you a bit about our master plan. I don't have a map to show you, unfortunately, because we're not at that stage yet. We've looked at some different um, possibilities, but don't have um, don't have a have a have a plan that I can show. I can tell you the basic components of it. That we are trying to overcome that um, that. Uh, the easy sort of fallback position of becoming a bedroom community or encouraging people to commute. We want to try to have a mixed use complete community approach. Uh, we would like to do something quite different in retaining a lot of farmland um, that we would be able to rent to um, local farmers, particularly young organic farmers. This is organic farmland. It's not easy to make organic farmland to have it um, uh, certified. And we'd like to be able to share that with people who, who have a similar passion for um, the kinds of things we do. We want to have expansive community gardens, trails, green spaces. And by using mixed zoning from R1 to R3, we hope to meet, meet the needs of people at every uh, different income level, family size, and, um, and even meeting accessibility needs. Oh, sorry, just... I want to point out to the use of alternative energy sources with a focus on geothermal and agrivoltaics. Um, if you don't know what agrivoltaics are, it's basically the idea of putting, um, using um, solar panels within farm fields as a way of creating uh, some shade because oftentimes our summers are getting to be too intense for some crops to grow well and we can get then uh, the double impact of the, uh, for the crops and for solar production. This is, uh, a, um, this is the site plan, not of course, a, um, it, it's, it's a site plan that we use on our website. So it's very simplified for, um, uh, for the public to see, for buyers to see. And you can see that on the right hand side is where our six townhouse units are. It says Langua Eco Homes above it. And then over here are these 24 single family lots uh, on this new street that have been purchased by another local home builder called Sinclair Homes. We partnered with them because they've shown a great interest and demonstrated a lot of building in net zero and net zero ready. So we have an agreement with them that their, all of the homes they build will be net zero or net zero ready. So our first phase is this five acres. You can see our six townhouses to the passive house standard and a couple of the Sinclair homes um, uh, dwellings there as well. So why did we build passive house? We knew we wanted deep green building. We knew like all of you that passive house was uh, so far above others and we couldn't find other builders to do this. We wanted to show that Passive House could compete commercially with other new house home builders. And we more, more than anything wanted it to be that proof of concept to move the needle on climate consciousness within the home building industry. And we think that our results, which are a superior building envelope, all electric mechanicals has given us, has really made us um, you know, locally known as a leader in how to decarbonize home building and home ownership. Um, I want to talk for a minute about building on spec. As I said, our design phase happened in January and February of 2020. We had no idea what was going to happen. I don't know if you can think that far back, but the radical growth in home building came as a huge surprise to a lot of people. I think at, at in January and February of 2020, we could just as easily have imagined uh, the construction industry falling off a cliff. So. Um, <laughs> So one of the things we decided on was that we would build townhomes thinking we could do it more, um, perhaps more economically, and we would do it on spec rather than try to do pre-construction. Um, when we saw how prices for materials were just so volatile, they were increasing almost month by month, we were getting notices from anybody we'd, we'd gotten a, a quote from saying, we can only hold this price for 40 days or 30 days and it will be going up again next month. We didn't feel comfortable setting sales prices that were based on um, any given moment because we knew they could change so radically. And we've heard stories, of course, as I'm sure you have, of builders who were caught in that trap where they had pre-sold and by the time they finished the build, they needed to add more to the price and that has been, um, uh, public relations disaster for them, as you can imagine. So um, I want to show you some images of the end results. 
um, an aerial shot of the townhouses. Um, uh, an image taken from the back, really amazing design that Michael and Rita came up with. Um, and you can see that two of the units have uh, a lower level uh, just because of the grade that we were building on. And then the remainder of the units um, further to the north um, are all built slab on grade. Um, the foyer, um, you get a sense of the engineered hardwood floors, uh, the solid wood staircase, um, beautiful tile, the great room. And just to the right of the great room, I'll show you next will be the kitchen. All of our cabinetry was made by Glenn Hartman's brother, Ian, um, who's such a fine cabinet maker. And he was able to help us um, to really accommodate all the low VOC requirements for our passive house um, cabinetry. And uh, that was one thing that was more challenging, I think for us in the Canadian market is that um, using, because we were using FIAS as our, um, our uh, verifier certifier, um, we needed to go along with the EPA guidelines, which don't always mesh terribly well with the, with the um, products that we had access to in the Canadian market. Um, so this infographic shows air changes per hour, and it was developed by a um, company fairly locally called Barrier Sciences Group. And I like what they've done with it where they've, um, uh, we've modified it obviously, but they, they've provided us with a number of um, different air changes per hour that you might expect in other homes um, going as low as 7.5 from an average Ontario home. If you look at houses across the board um, because of you know older existing housing stock up to Energy Star, R2000, Net Zero at approximately one, passive house at 0 0.6 and, um, and our houses which ended up with a, a score of 0 0.38. Now, Ed is going to, I'm sure, um, elaborate on what that number really means in terms of our, our testing, but um, I, I feel pretty proud uh, of that number. Um, so uh, the how's it going? Well, we're waiting for our buyers. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, the, the prime lending rate changed an awful lot between March and today, and it will go up again uh, in just another week. Uh, here in Canada across across the country and so while lower priced homes are continuing to sell well uh, overall the prices are are dropping dramatically 10 percent on average um, it looks as though six seven hundred thousand is about the sweet spot for um, purchase price of sales prices these days if you want to see a quick sale and we're not at that we're closer to we're around the million dollar mark for ours um, and so there's, you know, the obvious stress that we're feeling as new home builders, like others who, uh, who built with materials and labor at really high, high um, prices. And we just don't have a lot of margin to, um, uh, to, to lower our prices. We're not like somebody who's got a resale home that they've, they've owned for 20 or 30 years where we can say, well, I suppose we could afford to take a little less now that the market has changed. Um, and one one more um, thing that I, I suspect many of you have experience with is that Passive House remains largely unrecognized as a brand among home buyers. Um, and and I found again and again that in dealing with um, you know marketing professionals uh, that they they tend to not want you to focus on things like climate change and how a house might address climate change because it invokes anxiety in buyers. So here we've got this, these amazing homes that, um, that are indeed designed to address uh, the climate crisis. And, and I'm told not to, um, not to focus on that. So um, I, would, I would love to hear, um, you know, either, either now or later or connect with people who've got any experience in doing that, the kind of, uh, that kind of marketing. And, you know, as we head towards Christmas, we're really not, um, we're not putting any pressure on marketing right now. In January, we will be offering some new things like discounts for those who live and work in our area, um, vendor financing. Uh, it's, it's, you know, an, an old fashioned way of financing things where the vendor continues to hold um, uh, all or part of a mortgage. 
uh, so that you can create your own interest rates. You don't have to, um, buyers don't necessarily have to get uh, formal lending. And we'll be looking for publicity opportunities and we'll be celebrating our certification, which we feel confident is on its way. So that's everything from me for now. And I'm gonna pass it over to Ed Marion. I'm gonna take out my laser pen here. I never used it before. I don't even care if I don't need it. I wanna just have it there. Okay, here we go. So yeah, thank you, Nicole. That was, uh, that was uh, a good, uh, a good, uh, explanation of, of, of the uh, of the story behind this and um, now I'm going to focus on I guess the nuts and bolts of it uh, the the usual uh, air barrier continuous insulation details that a lot of us kind of seem to can't get enough of but uh, um, in any event uh, yeah so this is going to be basically you know how we got there this is the the site in, in its various kind of seasons throughout the winter and the, and, the, and the summer and here it is just before it uh, just as it was starting to get groomed for the uh, for the project uh, south would be by the way i'm looking south right here and the project is oriented lengthwise this way so why fias this is the main thing that that, uh, that, that comes up so um when I first was approached by the by the team to be the consultant, I looked at the at the energy modeling that they had done. And I looked at what what was on the table, and to me, it, it didn't seem like the PHI path was going to be feasible. Um, so that was probably the main reason um, for opting for FIAS. Um, there's less than ideal story, solar orientation. In other words, we couldn't really align the building to get a really good capture of of solar gain. Um, most of the glazing is facing east and west and subject to overheating, quite frankly, especially on the western exposure. So um, I've been working on projects like this since 2010, and, and I, I know that you know high gain glass can make the energy balance look really good. It makes it work out great, but it causes comfort issues, um, sometimes severe. So we, we, we're probably not going to be able to use the high solar gain glass that would have perhaps pushed us the rest of the way. Um, so, so the the, the fierce heat space heating target was attainable, um, but it was pretty close. So, the, our, the air change target that we set was uh, we had to pretty much hit it. There was not going to be much wiggle room. Um, FIAS does a, a, um, afford a bit more flexibility in terms of components, not necessarily needing PHI certified components. Having said that, we ended up using a lot of PHI certified components. Um, as Nicole mentioned, that net zero ready is in place in the project. We also, you know, looked at perhaps also doing net zero uh, as a complementary, um, as a complementary um, certification. But uh, the economics of it didn't really pan out. So, um, and then if there's the cost reality of a, of, a, of a spec for profit venture. If this was a project built for a particular homeowner or uh, uh, you know, perhaps a, a, a developer uh, for. Uh, Nonprofit housing or whatever. If if the if the goal it, it had to be passive house certified, um, they could probably absorb the cost of getting there. Uh, perhaps the, the nonprofit housing and affordable housing is a bad example, but certainly the the private uh, homes built for private homeowners. Certainly, if if that's what they want, then you know you would have to have the budget to make that happen, and uh, that's just not wasn't the cost reality here. We were trying to obviously end up where we would be in a competitive place at the end of the build. So um, when you choose FIAS, there's pros and cons with both FIAS and, and PHI. Um, one of the extra challenges, I guess, with FIAS is that you have to do the indoor air plus, you have to meet the indoor air plus requirements, um, you know, for uh, uh, VOCs and building materials and, and things like carpets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the EPA water stench, which, which uh, is the, you know, affects the flow rates of, um, uh, of uh, fixtures, as well as the um, amount of hot water that can, uh, the amount of time that can run until hot water reaches the farthest fixture. Um, these are programs that are uh, not familiar here in Canada, but whether your project is in the United States or Canada, you have to meet these other requirements as well. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Woofy Passive, this is sort of the, the the, the energy model. Uh, this is the front elevation here and the rear elevation. This is sort of the building blocks of the energy modeling tool. Um, 
the PHI uses uh, PHPP. I've worked with PHPP for a long time and with PH and lengthy with lengthy passive. Both of those give us great um, objective information on making decisions as far as the building envelope goes. This is sort of the summary page for the uh, uh, for the project. I've included these slides here so that anybody looking at this afterwards who wants to dial in on a little bit more specifics will have the, will have the information on hand. I apologize to my U.S. colleagues; it's all in metric, but um, um, it just gives you the, the, the rough idea. Like the, the ICFA, the floor area here, um, is roughly uh, 1,388 square meters, so about 13,000 square feet, give or take. Um, the um, FIAS requirement, I mean, FIAS 2018 plus core, which is the uh, pathway that we, that we were able to, to follow, um, we needed to hit 22.71. This was our our heating target, and uh, our pre-certification rate was 22.5, our, our, our number. So you can see there's not much wiggle room there, as you can look at the, at the little scale here. There's not much wiggle room for there, so all of a sudden, all the details became critical to execute properly, especially regarding air tightness. Um, this is the air tightness that we assumed of, of 0 0.75, and um, the uh, uh, source energy, is actually under core 5500, but the program doesn't let me enter a different target here. And it's, it's this is with the original or the, with the full uh, FIAS certification. Um, let me move on here. Okay, why we succeeded? Well, we had a great project team. Um, as Nicole mentioned, the Langwalk family sent uh, some of the team members away on passive house training. Um, so all of a sudden we were pretty much in an in integrated project design right from the start. Uh, all of the key stakeholders were at the design meetings and there was a lot of communication, a lot of really good um, uh, insight and ideas shared right from the very beginning. Um, uh, and um, that really helped us get to where we needed to go. Um, just a quick shout out again to the, the Langua family, John, Nicole and Mark, and the, the ar um, architects, Michael Wilson and Rito Sippa. Glenn Hartman, the general contractors, Zahn Engineering mechanical team, uh, very, very experienced, in my opinion, one of the most experienced and capable mechanical design teams in Canada. Uh, they have a lot of experience with these types of buildings. Any of us who have worked on these types of projects know how critical it is that the mechanical designers understand the types of buildings that, that these are. Um, Greg Leskin was our FIAS Raider verifier and answerer of every question that everybody had. So tip of the hat as well to, uh, to Greg. Um, envelope, how we did it, the devil is in the details. That's what the, this is for. So there was, we had a lot of good section drawings with uh, lots of good air barrier identification. It's shown in blue in here, but um, yeah, every single section was, was reviewed to make sure that the air barrier was in the right place. And everybody was exposed to this ad nauseum before construction even began. So everybody was totally aware what the implication was, what it meant, and where we needed, what we needed to do about it. So, and I would say like, this is the continuity is really the secret, the secret ingredient. And it's not, it seems like a simple term, but it's not necessarily intuitive when you get on a construction site. Most construction workers, no matter how capable they are, and like all of us are still kind of creatures of habit and they have ways of approaching things for the sake of efficiency and everything else that, um, preconditions them to doing things a certain way. So sometimes you just have to interrupt the regular construction sequencing to make sure that something gets executed properly. So I'm just gonna go through the different assemblies here. This the slab, we use a slab system by Legolet. Um, it, it was eight inch EPS R32. And um, you can see the air barrier here is right, it, it kind of in the middle of the, of the slab assembly. Uh, between several layers of insulation that transitions up the wall. This is for the foundation for the foundational wall to the lower two units that have basements. Um, the uh, air barrier moves up the ICF wall and then is sandwiched between the two layers of the main floor slab up here. So uh, th th this particular system is Passive House certified, and uh, there's a certificate to show to show that. This is the site being prepped for the slab on grade system. Now it does drop off at one end where the two other basements are. So this is the, the, the lower section going in here. Um, you can see that the uh, um, our gravel base has been compacted. I can't remember exactly what the engineering spec for, but it was, it'd be probably a minimum. Usually it's, it's anywhere from six to 
inches plus, depending on the site conditions. Um, but it did save having to excavate the site. It was a good candidate for this type of a system, the project. This is a system evolving now uh, with the steel reinforcement. Um, this is a, 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 a Nexum type of a block. This would be where the door, a door would be on top of here. So it's sort of a little bit more structural type of element that you can, that'll take the, and hold fasteners. Um, and it's a thermal bridge free connection to the existing slab. So the basement walls are ICF, but they have an extra component as well to take them to R44. So the, um, um, the slab assembly has a, a part that protrudes here. We'll, we'll, we'll see in, a, in an upcoming section uh, detail. Um, for the purpose of overlapping with the additional insulation, here you can see the foundation um, in place and the additional layer of insulation being applied as well. I mean, a, 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 a standard ICF block is only you know R22 approximately, right? So it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't enough R value for what we were looking to do. So that's why we added the extra there. This is some uh, drawings, again, uh, by Legolet. Legolet also made the wall, that wall insulation system. So you can see that the wall from the slab assembly, or the, the insulation from the slab assembly, right at this line here is where this is called the edge element. So this, this is, comes from the factory to whatever width that you're above insulation is. So, we have six inches on the outside and we put a six inch panel on top here. Uh, and it's attached with a thermal bridge free connection uh, to a metal track system that's embedded inside, the, uh, inside the, the foam. This is the plan section of a typical corner. So again, you can see you have total insulation continuity on the, around the building on the outside. And here's an example of where it can go up and intersect with the attic insulation. Right at this point here can sometimes be tricky in terms of not enough insulation. This is the above grade wall section of it now. Um, and you can see it being applied here on one of the gable ends. The, the building envelope stops kind of at the top of the foam here. So the we could have run this foam all the way up to the roof, but the carpenters, the build team decided that they would just bump the, the upper gable wall out um, as it didn't need to be insulated. Um, here's an example of the uh, uh, building with windows and how the foam kind of fits around it. Same here. The window bucks were sized to accommodate this six inches of foam. Uh, the attic has, uh, there's two types of roof assemblies. There's an attic assembly and then there's a cathedral truss assembly. The attic assembly, we had lots of room to put insulation in. So we have R80, um, nominal 72 effective. And the air barrier basically transitions up the wall here between the the sheathing and the insulation foam, and then right across the uh, roof assembly framing. And we'll take a closer look at how that works out. Uh, so the, our, our air barrier is, is a rigid air barrier. It's not a membrane air barrier. And this is just the partially insulated attic here with the cellulose. This is the cathedral roof section, uh, which we did with, with bats. Uh, we were originally wanting to use TJI's uh, uh, eye joists for the uh, for these rafters but we, we, we couldn't we just couldn't get them so we had to transition to a, to a truss assembly and of course the webbing between the trusses is, is very tricky to insulate um, whereas the TJI makes a nice it's got a nice smooth wall that can easily be insulated snugly against so you can sort of see some other insulation here turned at 90 degrees to the main layer that's basically just so that we could fill the, the cavity to as high a degree of fill and, and tightness as we could. Um, and then you can see that the, this is the air barrier detail on the underside of this. Um, the air barrier, as you know, in a building can transition from place to place. Sometimes it's more closer to the outside, sometimes it's all the way on the inside. Here it transitions all the way to the inside out of necessity. We'll get a closer look at that in a second. Um, our windows are, were PHI uh, certified as well. We used VETA windows. And um, the, for those of you who want to know what the our U values are, this is the imperial U value, it's, uh, 0 0.16, the average U value in metric it's 0 0.906. Um, it's showing average solar heat gain of 0 0.29. That's the calculated value. The actual solar heat gain of the glass was 0 0.35, 0 0.35 on all, on all of the elevations, east and west. And there's 
virtually almost no windows on the south elevation. There's only one, I think, in the whole building. And same with the doors. The doors came from Beta, and they're absolutely killer doors. Okay, air barrier continuity. This is really good what got us to where we are. And again, the devil is in the detail. So corners can be tricky to do, you know, they tend to tear sometimes, so they have to be repaired carefully. And there was no having to tell people that here. <laughs> they, everybody was on it. They kind of knew exactly what it needed to be done. But uh, although I think it was a different crew that, that put this membrane down, I think maybe they did need, they did need to point it out to them. But uh, in any event, they got the job done. Just some more details of how all the air barrier all the systems, the drain pipes, the, the ejector, uh, sump pumps or sewage ejectors, um, and how the air barrier transition out of the slab, is, at slab assembly is going to connect to the main to the main wall. Um, here's the basement air barrier continuity. Um, we opted to use a continuous membrane on the outside, um, stemming from the discussion and the idea that ICF isn't always airtight. Um, I've done a couple of projects now where we've used either poly or some sort of membrane on the um, ICF wall, and it has yielded really high levels of airtightness. Um, I think because of the certification involved, we didn't want to take the chance of, of not doing something like that. So you can see that the slab, trans the air barrier in the slab transitions and is connected here to the to the basement wall air barrier and then continues up from there. Um, here's just a shot of the various steps involved in making the uh, in connecting the window uh, air barrier to the main wall air barrier. And of course we're using zip sheathing and with the taped end. Um, they even caulked the fasteners here. Um, now this is the um, roof assembly or the, 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 the roof, the ceiling on top of the, this is going to be the attic. This is going to be the insulated attic. So um, down below, you see that there's eye joists, basically representing a ceiling cavity. Um, typically, like the trusses will supply the ceiling, right, for the, for the room below it. And if you want to do continuous high quality air barrier, you have to attach something to the underside of the trusses. It can be some sort of a membrane. It can be um, some sort of a sheet good and tape with tape joints, whatever. There's different strategies, but a lot of the time you still need all kinds of soffits for other mechanical stuff. So um, this is a strategy that I've used on a number of projects that again has yielded really, really high levels of air tightness and also uh, an excellent place to stuff all kinds of mechanical stuff. So um, this is connected to the exterior wall at this, at the outside edge here. And then it transitions, and this is where the interior cathedral truss is. So right here where the transition is, it kind of goes underneath this sill plate, and it comes out here on the inside, and it's taped up this short section of knee wall and then up again. So and this is where it's going from the roof underneath. So again, it's just one of those little details that makes continuity continuity. And then you're not all of a sudden having to backtrack and trying to stuff caulking or whatever um, underneath that sill plate um, because you don't have a continuous connection there. Um, this is between the units. Um, you also need to achieve uh, certain levels of airtightness between units uh, under the PS certification protocol. I'm not sure about PHI, but I believe it's 0 0.3 air. You can't have more than 0 0.3 air changes between the uh, between the units. So this is Nixon block, and it was selected chiefly for its sound attenuation qualities. Like it's it's really good at, at, at keeping the noise transmission down between the units. Um, this is a a, 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 concrete, a a mixture of I guess wood fiber and concrete, and then it's all a solid concrete fill in the middle with with steel rebar. And um, but it also it turns out it's it's pretty porous. It's, it's not terribly airtight. We didn't know that exactly at this point, but we suspected that that might be the case. And so we kind of set ourselves up to offer uh, a, a contingency. We made sure that we installed ledgers or, or, or a membrane behind the ledgers so that 
if we needed to, we would be able to connect the uh, a membrane to the wall spaces and therefore capturing the uh, uh, the air tightness required. So, um, so in the end, um, this is what we just submitted for certification. We, we ended up at 19.02 kilowatt hours per square meter. Our target was 22.71. So we're well, we're well below it. And it's chiefly owing to having this amazing air tightness number. So it's a 0 0.38 is very, it's very good, very impressive. Um, I know that there's builders all over North America crushing air tightness now. So this is like um, not perhaps as, as uh, uh, jawbone dropping as it would have been a couple of years ago, but it's still definitely in, in one of the top, you know, got to be in the top percentile of all, of all air tightness tests. Um, as I said, it's, it's becoming, a, a, builders are really getting the knack of this now and it's, a, it's making a, a, a big difference, but uh, um, so yeah. I mean, it, you know, as we all get better at this, it, it can we can maybe start planning to do, maybe we can design at 0 0.3 air changes, you know, that would probably uh, impact the amount of insulation that you can put on. The, the, the things that, that tend to move the, this, uh, uh, you know, heat demand number a lot um, are air tightness and solar gain after insulation has kind of reached its maximum, right? You reach diminishing returns on the insulation side and the building doesn't want to respond anymore as you keep adding insulation. So you have to rely on other tools, but um, as I said, air tightness is definitely something that uh, that is a key factor, and we really uh, we really crushed it here. The build team really really crushed it. Um, continuity is also really super important in uh, in terms of insulation, and um, one of the key design features, and one of the striking features about this, is these shading sockets that you've seen the finished uh, in the finished photos, and. Um, it was really critical that we get those built without interrupting the uh, the, the uh, continuous insulation concept, um, and we planned for that. It, it, we 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 the, at the original drawing, I believe, it had it connected right to the framing, but we were able to find a way of um, uh, making the connection through the insulation. And um, there's the drawing with the air barrier shown through that. This air barrier is in blue. And but nonetheless, it's there. Um, and in any event, this made a really big difference. You know, a lot of the times that would just get connected right to the framing and then you'd be trying to insulate around it, whatever. It just, it just it doesn't, it's not a nice detail um, to try and fix if it's not done that way the first time. So, um, you know, there was obviously concerns about structural integrity and stuff like that. All these things got discussed, they all got tabled, they all got discussed and they all got solved and uh, it made a, a really great detail. So. Um, our HVAC system, I could do a whole presentation on HVAC, but just briefly summarizing it here. It's an all-electric system. There's no gas appliances. Heating and cooling provided by Mitsubishi S-Source heat pumps. The, we've got the hyperheat models, which can operate down to minus 25 Celsius or minus 13F. Uh, we've got a Zender Comfort 2350 um, energy recovery ventilator, 86% heat recovery efficiency, and MERV 13 supply air filter. And our domestic hot water is um, supplied by a green um, heat pump water heater. Um, again, for those of you who want to refer back to the design basis for this, this gives us our, you know, our um, design winter conditions and um, the different heat loads for all of the different units and cooling loads. What's interesting about this, and, and this speaks to our climate, the challenges of building our climate is that in several cases here, the, um, the heat load, the cooling load is bigger than the heat load. And we're in Southwestern Ontario. So you have extremes in both directions. It makes mechanical design really, really challenging for any building, but especially for these types of buildings. So again, kudos to the, the team at Zone really understood this and its implications with the type of building that we were building. And uh, it ended up uh, it ended up really being a good, a good match. I mean, this is the uh, the Mitsubishi system here. It's a uh, um, multi zone. Uh, this is a single zone, and this is the uh, a second fan coil that would be used in the basement. The two units with the basement with the outdoor uh, condensing unit. Again, I could go a lot deeper in this. I'm just literally skipping over it. Um, this is a sender system, and it's. Certificate certificates again to those who want to extract the technical detail from this. Um, 
you can see the complexity in, in installing a separate ventilation system. Um, and I've worked on projects where we've combined them in the past. And But the thing is, is that so ventilation air and space conditioning air have different requirements. They have different flow rates. They need different duct design. It's best to separate them. There's an argument that you've got economies of scale if you are you know, able to pair the systems up through the same duct design. But I, I think that it, it's also likely that you're going to end up with underperforming systems if that's the case. So this is really the, the Cadillac treatment, um, if you can still say Cadillac these days. Maybe perhaps I just blasphemed by saying black Cadillac. But in any event, it's the goal. It's, the, it's a really the, the top, the, the, the top notch of treatment for, for, for these types of projects. And um, there's uh, there's our heat pump water heater in case you haven't seen one before. And um, yeah, uh, part you know we have to pay attention to the to the run times on hot water from to the furthest fixture, and that you know created some challenges again from from the um, for the design team who designed all the plumbing runs and whatnot. Um, also, it's on engineering, and that's basically it. So. Uh, um, this is this is it. And as, again, they, we really crushed it. And uh, the from the build team to the design team to the on the ground wearing a different hat every five minutes, like Mark Langlois, um, everybody did a really great job. And I'm really proud to have been associated with this project. It's been a lot of learning. Every single project is, and um, um, it's just been a real pleasure. <music>